risk is a, is a relative thing, right? Risk is a thing that is about, percep- is about measuring reality, but it's also about what our perception of um, potential danger is, right? So when we look at this picture, uh, I think what is easy to do is look at this and we're looking at basically a road that is no more, right? We're looking at a bunch of people that feel stranded um, and, and there's, some crazy, there's some crazy water thing going on, right? We tend to look at this and we tend to say, oh man, those, those poor saps, look at those poor folks. They lived in a dangerous area. They, they um, you know, maybe didn't get out in time or they didn't build their bridges strong enough or whatever. I think there's, there's a tendency to think those poor, those poor sods, those poor, those poor folks. Um, the reality is we should be careful of throwing stones, one. Two, the world that we live in, the entirety of our planet is becoming a much more risky enterprise, a much more risky place to be by its very nature, thanks to the activities of our species. So what used to be considered an acceptable level of risk or a place that maybe was not perceived to be particularly risky, increasingly those areas are becoming um, uh, either more risky or at least our confidence in the level of, of non-risk is, is, redu- is going away. Okay, case in point, us right here in Southern California. We are, our county gets a mix of water Depends on what district we're in and, and, and this and that, but, but roughly we get something on the order of about a third-ish of our water supply from the Colorado River. The river that runs through seven states in the western U.S. and is the most, it's not the biggest river, so it's not the highest volume, it's not the nothing, it's claim to fame is it's the most litigated river in history. So seven states make claim to that, that, wa- those water resources that, that lie within that watershed. And we are one of the major consumers of that. Southern California is one of the major consumers. So when we have water coming from, you know, raindrops that fell, say, in Colorado, uh, are, is part of the mix that helps make our coffee and water our lawns and stuff like that. The other third is going to be our, our local supplies groundwater, local surface reservoirs, that kind of stuff. And then roughly a third is coming from what's known as the State Water Project, the California State Water Project. And so that's taking water from the generally wetter northern part of California, generally Sierras, north, northward and eastward of us, capturing that snowfall, putting it essentially in a series of pipes and surface storage and shunting that down both for the farmers in the Central Valley or by far the primary users. Then in our case, it, some of it scoots down and gets to us. So this very elaborate network of water plumbing um, that was erected over the past 75 years um, is what allows us to have more stability. It's what allow, has allowed us to have more growth. It's what, allow, it's what has augmented our agriculture activities and made Ventura County one of the most profitable counties in the nation and therefore the world in terms of agricultural productivity and, and all everything else that we can, can think of. So this is very much so a, um, an intricate network of delivery systems. One of, the key, one of the key nodes is in the area around the San Francisco Bay Delta. In this area, which is primarily the, the, the water is managed, the flows are managed primarily by earthen dams. An earthen dam that goes along the side of a river is called a levee. So we'll hear all about those when we get to New Orleans. And we'll hear about that before, but, but we'll, you'll really hear a lot about them when we get there. Um, now, uh, this is what's separating, for example, the fresh water from the salt water. Danielle. No, levees are not designed to move. Levees, levees, so there's, there's natural levee. There's a natural levying process which just happens because of the way the river goes and the hydrology and, and materials deposited on the sides of rivers. So levees are a natural phenomenon. We augment those. So we, we come up to an area that has one of those features and we basically take a bunch of 
material, usually dirt and, and clay and stuff, and pile that on and make it bigger. So levees are the best protection if you're trying to keep a river away from something. But as, you, as you, we'll see when we, we start looking at levees, it's just basically a pile of stuff. Right? So if we want, say, higher protection, we have to make this go higher. Right? And so that means we've got to dump a lot more uh, material because some of, the, some of the, the particles will go here and they'll dribble down the side and some will go here and dribble down the side. So you have a huge base relative to the height. Right? So it's possible what you'll see when we get to New Orleans is if we're out in the middle of Iowa or something, it's probably not that big a deal. But if we're in the middle of, say, Denver, New York, New Orleans, San Francisco, just sort of throwing a bunch of dirt up there and expanding the footprint, that maybe doesn't work, right? Maybe that goes into somebody's property. Maybe that goes into a road. So then the other major feature is we take something, a structure, you can imagine like a metal fence, and, and putting that on here. So that, in effect, we raise the elevation without needing to dump a bunch of dirt on the side. That's called a flood wall. So levee is a pile of dirt. Could be natural, could be augmented. And then if we have an extra, extra um, shooting up fence, if you will, a water fence, that's a, a flood wall. Cool? So this is an example of one of our levees in the San Francisco Delta. This picture is taken in 2004 by the state, our state uh, Department of Water Resources. And you see a failure there. So you're looking at a road on top of a levee. It's very common to have roads on top of levees. And you're looking at a road right there. And there's a bunch of cars that aren't driving anywhere, right? Because there's no road anymore right there. So this structure failed. Uh, in this case, because of flooding. These oftentimes are old structures. Like I said, they, they're built upon some natural levying, some natural tendency of sediment to accumulate. Then we augment it. And maybe we augmented it last year. More typically, we probably augmented it 50 years ago. And then before that, maybe like 60 years ago. And So it's, it's sort of an accumulation. So imagine, well, if you guys have seen my office, you know how insanely non order that is you know and then go, just keep doing that for a decade and then 20 years and 30 years so some of these levees are relatively well built others were just kind of eh, throw some stuff there some farmer drove a tractor threw some dirt up you know something simple so there's lots of vulnerability and there's there's thousands of miles of these levees right we're not talking about uh, one or two two um, structures Tons of stuff going on. Now, this is in this region where the salt water from the San Francisco Bay Delta merges with the fresh water uh, coming down from the Sierras, the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers. And so for you and I to get water, we drink fresh water. If, say, one of these levees fails due to an earthquake, due to way too much rain, due to whatever the reason, and that salt water contaminates the inflow, you and I can't drink that water. So if that happens tomorrow, we, it depends on where we are, and, and I don't have the most recent numbers, but we're talking about on the order of three to five days worth of water that we have, and then it goes off. So that's about one third of our water supply will boop, go off. And in reality, it would go off immediately because we try to archive and save that water, that, that fresh water that's there for, for essential purposes. So this is the situation that you and I are living in right now. Um, failures are a, a reality, and they've been going on for a long time. As we go through time, we're seeing them happen more frequently, um, but also more importantly, when they do fail, they, they have greater and greater consequences. So levees are not a phenomenon of New Orleans. They're not a phenomenon of the South. They're a phenomenon of most of our riverine areas around the world but they're definitely a component in places like California. Hayden. Is, are levees failing more often now because of bigger storms and more water flow? Yes. So that's what we're going to talk about next. So, so good question. Before we get to it, one last picture. So, so that's, that's what you and I need to drink and you and I need to, to go about our daily lives. 
This is a map, obviously, of Ventura County here, where we are. And there, we have levees on our rivers. We, we, have, we have three main year-round rivers that dump into the ocean here in Ventura County. We have the Santa Clara River, we have the Ventura River, and we have the um, Camarillo, uh, uh, Cayugas Creek, excuse me, Camarillo Creek. Jeez, it's like I'm a, an idiot or something. Um, so those, all of those structures, all of those waterways are levied pretty much for the entirety of their length, meaning they have these earthen walls on the side to contain the flow. Because again, we hate nature doing what nature wants to do. We want to tell nature. We want to tell nature when it can flood, when it can't flood. So that was the basis for all this beginning to control these things. And um, I mean, there were understandable reasons. We'd have floods, people would die, people's farms would go under, and people say, oh my God, this is horrible. We need to exert some control. And in the 20th century, as we were gaining incredible prowess with engineering, people started saying, well, maybe we can change that. And that was the birth of, of our modern attempt to control the waterworks in the US and around the world. And so, so we started with these a little area that was around, say, someone's house or around in a city center, and we made a levee around it. So if it flooded, the city center wouldn't, wouldn't flood. But then as soon as we put that levee in, that makes the water get higher. Right? You guys with me? Because if, if the water can spread out, it's going to be at level X. But if we start squishing it, just like if you're, if you're in, the, in the bathtub and, and, we, and we sort of, um, I don't know what that analogy is. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> anyway, basically, you guys get it, right? As we constrain it, it's going to go higher. So then all of a sudden, now I'm safe, but the, the, the people downstream, now that water is even higher than it otherwise would have been. So they're actually going to get more flooding than they would be but, um, uh, prior to me putting in my walls on the side of the river. And now they're like, screw that. So then they put in a wall. Now both of us are constricting the flow. So now for the, the people below them, now it's even higher than it was just a little bit ago. And so with that progression, we see this, um, this squeezing of the water. And all of a sudden, in a very quack, quick progression, all these waterways will get levied. All of the sides of the river will get levied. And that's the situation we have. Now, here, so this is a map um, from a couple years ago. And these, these are the levees in um, Ventura County. We'll talk about flood risk and, and what that means uh, later. But the idea here is these are areas. People have put their houses up behind these levees. Because why? It's a levee. It's all good, right? And we put a ballpark there. And we put a... a kindergarten and we put a whatever shopping center and all the stuff we typically put in because people think ah it's dry right hasn't flooded last year didn't flood in the last 10 years didn't flood in the last 20 years let's this is valuable land let's let's use it for whatever we want to use it for right well in the wake of things like hurricane katrina that is that has helped force some of us to take a more realistic look about flood risk and so we've been marching across the country and reassessing the, the vulnerability to flooding. Part of that includes looking, and this is, in this case, this is an, an organization that we'll hear a lot about in our class. It's called the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Don't boo, don't hiss yet, because you'll be doing a lot of that probably later. Um, so, uh, th so just to explain the Army Corps of Engineers, it, it sounds like it's the Army, and it kind of is the Army but it's primarily a civilian branch of our government. It began, with, it began when our country was young, and ports and harbors were incredibly important to our young nation. We wanted to make sure that the harbors wouldn't get clogged up and all this and that. So we're trying to figure out, hey, who knows how to do something? Hey, let's call in the military engineers, the guys that would build bridges and stuff during mil military campaigns. So they became our, our first expert set of building engineers and because they're associated with the army we just call them the army corps of engineers core spelled c-o-r-p-s so the corps of engineers and they got going and essentially what's happened is it's metastasized so the head people the head the head uh, people in whatever region or overall of the army corps are actually you know military enlisted people officers folks that are in the military but the vast, 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 vast majority of the employees are a civilian employee of the Department of Defense. So you guys could go work for the Army Corps of Engineers. 
And this is the entity that does dam building. Ironically, these, this is also the entity that takes the dams down. It's, it gets it's strange. Um, but they just sort of start inheriting more and more jobs. And so in the context of places like New Orleans, in the context of places like Ventura County, they're the, they're the entity that either built, back in the day, they, there used to be actual engineers that worked for the Army Corps of Engineers. Now they're basically hardly any engineers that work for them, by and large. They're project managers, and we farm it all out because we believe that, hey, the private sector can do it so much better than the government. So, so but back in the day when we originally built stuff, the Army Corps was the entity that was building it. Now they basically are a throughput for money. So now they say, here's a bunch of money, private contractor. Can you do this construction for me? When these levees were all built, the Army Corps of Engineers certified them and said these are safe. But based on what's been happening with climate change, with, with new understandings of risk, we've come in, again, in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, and, and have done a reassessment. What happened? Check it out. You see a lot of red on this map, yeah? So red is bad, right? Green is good, yellow is eh, kind of sketch, but red is bad. So when we reassessed uh, this, this, our area a few years ago, it was, I believe it was 17 different levies were either decertified or had their certification lowered. That means if you live behind those, those uh, areas, you are in a flood zone. That means it's really hard to get insurance because is somebody gonna sell you insurance if you're in the path of a flood? No, right? And you're kind of screwed because a lot of times, for example, when people um, buy a house, um, you get a mortgage, it's basically a loan, and, and oftentimes in that, in that part of that loan, since in other words, the bank is owning your house for, for until you pay off that loan, they say, hey, you gotta get insurance to make sure if something catastrophic happens, you know, we get the value of the house back. So it's this really dangerous place. And we'll see the effect that this is having in Louisiana, where um, a, lot of this, a lot of the area that up until recently was considered safe, it wasn't, right? No, no, nothing in reality changed in the last couple of years, right? Just our understanding of how vulnerable we are changed. So, so we are vulnerable to levy failures. Camarillo, is vulnerable to levy failures. Ventura is vulnerable to levy failures. This is not a uniquely New Orleans phenomenon. This is truly a, a national challenge. So we have that going on. Then we have our current situation. Also, thank you, climate change. We are in this huge drought, right? This is, this is the sixth year of our drought. We appear to be, at least much of the state, perhaps exiting it, thankfully, at least in the short term. Although the long-term prognosis is that that's, the drought is going to be much more likely the new normal. And so this is a, a drought severity index. So the darker the color, the more, the more droughty we are, the more water starved we are across the state. And um, the map on the left is what we looked like last year, right? Really hurting, or at least the vast majority of the state was hurting. And thanks to these uh, huge amounts of rainfall we've had in the last a um, few months, much of the state of California has left that. There is only a, one little teeny small area in the entirety of the state of California that remains in extreme drought. That's you guys. <laughs> Merry Christmas. You'd think, oh, it's the Mojave Desert. Oh, it's the whatever, east side of the Sierras. No, it's us. Everybody else has, has gotten back to closer to what is quote unquote normal. That's a dangerous term. When people say normal rainfall, they mostly have their head up their butt. They don't understand what they're talking about because our rainfall in California is massively variable. And when people say normal, quote unquote, that's a very misleading leading term. But, but let's say closer to a typical rainfall event. And so it's great. The grass is looking green, right? The hillsides are looking green. Plants are germinating. Awesome. So this is the situation. With climate change, people that uh, are not familiar with climate change often incorrectly read it as, oh my God, it, we're, we're gonna be in drought all the time. That's not exactly the best read. The best read is that, the term I like to use is global weirding. <laughs> That's a much more accurate description. So things, the rates of change are going really, really up. So when we have rain events, it's more likely to be a lot of rain. And when it doesn't rain, it's more likely to really not rain. 
So we're, we're heading to this era of much more extreme swings. Just like, oh, I don't know, we've been seeing the last couple years. Not, not less rain, but massively less rain. And then when it rains, like this, the so-called atmospheric river dumps tons of water. So that's the situation that, that, we're, that we were heading into this past weekend. This is the Oroville Dam. This is up in Butte County. This is, this is about 70, 80 miles uh, uh, away from Sacramento. And this is this dam. And this is the tallest dam. It's not the large, it doesn't retain the most amount of water, but as far as the height of the actual dam face, this is the highest, tallest dam in the US. Uh, was built not quite 50 years ago. And this is a key, this is probably the most important component in that water delivery system I mentioned, the state water project to bring us and other, other people around the state water. This is arguably the most import, important node, at least in terms of surface water storage. And so what we're looking at here is, he, here is the uh, valley, we put in a dam, and then we allow the water to flood the old valley that's, that's above the dam. And so typically there's a pinch point. That's what happened here. Here's this river. And we, we filled this in. Now you can make a dam of dirt. You can make a dam, dam of concrete, what have you. And then, so the water piles up here. And uh, then in many cases, we actually run, run that water through pipes that turn turbines. And we actually generate power, generate hydroelectricity that way. And that's how it typically goes. And this is what it this is what it's looked like. This is a picture of uh, I think from about uh, two two uh, about two years or so ago. So this is was this is one of our class. This was up until a few months ago. This was the, one of the classic pictures when people would come from around the country and do a story on California's drought. Take a picture of this. The other the other classic one would be Kachuma Lake here in our region of the world, which is currently seventy seven feet below its uh, its um, typical uh, height. Um, so here we go. So this is Oroville Dam. So again, this is where we are. We're 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 north of um, Sacramento, and it's about uh, it's about um, 20, 30 miles from our sister campus, Chico State, which is Chico is, is north of the dam. And a lot of people that are evacuating now have been evacuating to to Chico. So this gives you a little bit more of a sense of what's going on. So here we have this, again, this impounded waterway. And then we have some stuff here that we'll talk about. And then the water goes down. And then, just like everywhere else, ah, there's, there's some towns, right? Towns that existed historically. But now that we've put these structures to manipulate water, people have said, ah, it's cool. I can, I can you know, put my house next to the, the edge. Or we can do more development or, or what have you. I should go back to this picture. So here we go. The water's all here. The water, here's the, here's the face of the, the main part of the, where the water comes out is over here. Um, so that's off to the right of this picture right here. If something goes wrong, if the water starts piling up, if it's coming in too fast, we have a spillway which releases that water to go out so that we don't have a, a you know water breaking the dam basically that's this thing right here this is called the this is called the spillway it's basically a concrete chute just like a, like a big giant concrete slide and we can open up the when the when the water gets to to so this is high this part here is about 20 feet lower than the the peak of the dam so if we have some valves in here. We can, we can release water when it starts getting high, and the water goes down here, gets in the river, and just keeps on going. Right over here is this uh, other low point. This is the this, this second emergency spillway. That, there's, there's no concrete. There's no hardened slide. It's just low, just dirt, trees, stuff like that. This has never been used ever in the 50-year his the history of this particular structure. It's never been tested because the water has never been that high before. Or at least when it was threatening to be that high, we could let water out at a gradual pace, and it was, it, it, we never allowed the water to get that high. So this starts to happen about, um, about uh, a week, week and a half ago. So all of a sudden, people are watching. This water should be flowing smoothly. Look at this. So again, the main face of the, of the dam is over here. Here's where the water's coming out. 
water's going down. It should be nice and pretty and all smooth and boom, boom, boom. And going. All of a sudden, people started saying, what is that? <laughs> this big, giant hole started opening up. So what's going on here is this water is flowing down. It's hitting a, um, a hole and kicking up. Are you leaving? Okay, so getting back to our what's going on in Orville Dam. So, so all of a sudden, these guys start noticing, what is up with this water? It's not going smoothly. Started looking at it. Started looking at it. Huge hole is opening up, right? So on the order of 20 feet deep, on the order of a couple hundred feet wide, um, still we don't entirely understand why yet because uh, we haven't had it. We've just been able to get in and start looking at it. But basically, this big hole is opened up. And that's a problem because now check out what's going on. So here's, here's the water flooding down. Now it's starting to cause a problem. It's starting to cut this out. It's starting to tow that away. And the, it's just like you can imagine building a sandcastle and then having a fire hose and shooting the fire hose in the sandcastle. At first, the, only the, the front face slips away, but as you put more and more and longer, eventually you start cutting away more and more and more into the base, into the middle of the sandcastle. And if it's just right here on the right, it's going to hurt some trees and cause some problems. But if it starts migrating towards the base of the dam, that's not good, right? So the response was, uh, so this is the worry. The worry is that uh, you, know, you, you have an erosion situation and it just cuts, 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 and it eventually undercuts the structure, the, the support structure, and it weakens it. And all this massive weight of this big, maybe, maybe, it's, a, maybe it's a small channel in New Orleans, maybe it's a big dam here in California, but whatever it is, eventually um, the, the force of this water pushing down into the side is going to fold that thing over and you're going to have a catastrophic collapse. It's not a little dribble, dribble, dribble. It's a kaboom over at one point in time. So um, it's amazing the parallels that you're going to see to New Orleans. Just, just this is weekend, what happened with Oroville Dam. So you start seeing things like this. People start saying, no way. Dam can never collapse. Don't you worry about it. It's all good. So in this case, uh, this argument is saying, hey, check it out. Again, here's the, here's the dam. Here's the face of the dam. Here's where the, the water typically goes through the hydropower plant. That's the, the typical place where water would egg, uh, come through the dam and enter the stream channel. Here is that emergency spillway. And then that, here's where that hole is. But don't worry about it because there's a big ridge here is what this, was what this uh, website with this graphic is saying. It's all good. This is, this is lower, um, and, and there's a ridge here, and so the water is all going to go this way. So it might cause some problems. It might knock down some power poles here or there, but it's not going to, you don't have to worry about the dam failing. Hmm. Right? Maybe. Yeah. But that spillway was never supposed to start collapsing. And, and this area was supposed to work fine. We would never tested it. There would never been a test. It, it, it's, you know, this dirt face that was built 50 years ago. So it's probably fine, right? So don't you worry. So then we started, and then, um, uh, so the, the issue is, we normally would be fl flooding the water down here, but now we're worried, right? Now, now we've had that comprom compromised situation, so we can't let water out as fast as we want. Recall we're in this uh, wonderful situation of, of not being in a drought anymore, in a sense, and so we have all this water dumping down, and so these guys are like, um, the water is coming in, right? It's coming in all around. It's more and more water in, more and more water. How, do we, how are we going to get it out? And so we can't use this anymore. So then starting uh, early last week, we started cutting trees down here, right? Because these are, these, are, these are oak trees. These are whatever has grown up there in the last 50 years. Um, and so crews start cutting out so we don't have a, a big chunk of debris that would come down here and then go in the river and maybe cause some problems down there. So we're trying to clean it up. Okay, cool. Water starts to overtop last Saturday night and go over that, that second spillway. Very quickly on into Sunday, it starts to become uh, some problems are started to be noted, right? So here we go. Here's this water spinning over. And check it out. Now this stuff is starting to erode. So now we're starting to cut into this dirt, right? Again, again, there's, there's still this ridge over here. And then people start to freak out. So then they say, uh, let's turn on the other spillway again because we, this is not good. So then we reactivate, as you can see in this picture, we reactivated this channel, even though it's, it's cutting and everything because we needed to get that water down quick. 
uh, this is what it looks. This is what it looked like um, on uh, as it was uh, su- su- late Sunday, as it was going through. And then Sunday afternoon, l- late afternoon, evening, the sheriff says, uh, "Actually, you know what? Let's everybody leave right now." Right. So the uh, unclear the exact numbers. Original originally, people talked about a hundred thousand. Then people talk about 200,000. I think the, the most recent best estimate was 100, about 188,000 folks were, were deemed to be in the path, potentially all the way down to Sacramento, although the main problem is that the town's proximate to the, to the dam there in Oroville and the surrounding communities. And so the sheriff says, uh, you know what? Get the heck out. Everybody leave, right? And we started seeing flooding because now more and more water is coming down. And again, do, do, people, do people expect their parks and stuff to be flooded? No, just like in New Orleans, right? People didn't. Everybody here had grown up never, ever seeing a flood like this. In fact, all the news reports were on Thursday and Friday. Well, it's not as bad as 1997. That was the real big problem. This is nothing. I heard, must have heard that seven or eight different times from different people. It's not a problem. They were using an incorrect baseline. They were using their recent history as a model for future. That's a natural thing. We tend to do that all the time. That is not necessarily the smart way to go forward in this changing world of ours. We saw it with Deepwater Horizon, see it with Hurricane Katrina, saw it with uh, San Onofre. We see it with all these issues. Everybody, we use our, our previous experience to guide us and it sometimes gets us into trouble. So check it out. So now we have this huge amount of water that's starting to cut rivulets, all this, all this and that. This is starting to expand and grow towards the dam, right? So still far away, not in risk of the dam collapsing per se, but we are possibly in danger of, of having sort of a catastrophic break here and having a big, a big wedge of water, you can imagine, go down. And if you're in your home, you could be flooded, you know, really potentially quick, depending on how that water plays out. So even if the dam doesn't fail, this is a dangerous situation, which is why the sheriff said, everybody get the heck out. So let's watch this story here. This is from, um, this is from yesterday, I think. Still see this as a dangerous situation, though they do say there are reasons for hope. However, they are keeping the evacuations in place for right now. Let's show you some video of the problem. As you mentioned, the Oroville Dam is the tallest dam in America. Several days ago, they started noticing problems on what's called a spillway. Basically, a spillway is a way for the dam to release water so it doesn't overflow. They have a main spillway, kind of looks like a slide, if you will, a cement slide. There was some erosion going on underneath of that cement spillway. It eventually caused a hole in the spillway. So they started using a secondary spillway, more of a natural spillway, where they also can release water. Well, that one started eroding, and they started seeing more problems. Well, yesterday, things got very urgent. Officials got some news, got some information that made them think that this spillway could be compromised. If that happened, they, that could send 30 feet high flood of water into the neighboring areas. So they ordered the evacuations of more than 100,000 people. Among those evacuated were more than 500 inmates of the Butte County Jail. They were taken to Alameda County. That's something that just came out in this news conference. They said they didn't release where they were taking those inmates to yesterday for safety concerns. However, they say they are making some progress. They were releasing a lot of water through the spillway, one of the compromised spillways, and they say that has reduced some of the water in the reservoir there so they think things are looking better. However, they are still not ready to let people back in. Here's more from some local officials. Uh, This is still a dynamic situation. It's still a situation we're trying to assess the damage. And we need to make, we need to have time to uh, make sure that before we allow people back into those uh, areas, it is safe to do so. So I want to make it clear. The evacuation is still in effect. We're working um, to really in, uh, dig down into the reservoir and move as much water out of that reservoir. And so we have space for the storms that we expect to um, come in as well as the snow runoff later this spring. 
Now, one of the reasons the sheriff was being adamant that the evacuations are still in effect, he said at the beginning of that news conference that there were rumors floating around that the evacuations are going to be lifted at 4.15 this afternoon. He said those rumors are absolutely false. They do not know when they're going to lift the evacuations at this point. As you heard him say, it is still a situation they're monitoring by the minute to see when they might be able to let people back in here. He said he's heard the criticism. A lot of people have complained that maybe they acted too fast. He said it's up to him to secure the community, make sure the community is safe and he can't keep it on his conscience or wouldn't be able to live with himself if he were to let people back in and then something happened to that dam and water started flowing into homes and putting people's lives at risk. So right now, evacuations still in place here in Oroville and the surrounding areas. For now, So that's the situation as of uh, today. All these things are real, right? All these things are real concerns. I encourage you guys to read some of the news coverage um, the last couple days. What you'll hear is people, well, my mom was sick. I called the ambulance. Couldn't, no ambulance could come because all the roads are clogged, right? So everything was, everything was clogged with people. Right, which would normally be, I forget, uh, you know, say a 20 minute drive, 30 minute drive was becoming four hour, five hour, six hour, right, drive. Um, ambulances can't, emergency vehicles can't get to where they're going. So you're stuck home with your mom. What do you, I'm not going to leave my mom, right? You're going to stay there. Other people maybe had to have pets or they have horses or something like that that they, that they that we've a huge phenomenon that became apparent. Um, it was apparent before, but it really drove home during Katrina, which was people will not leave their, you guys saw that news clip we saw last time, they will not leave their animals. They will not leave, many people will not leave their animals. So that's a real concern. Um, uh, most people, as with Hurricane Katrina, most people left. There's a fraction of folks that, eh, I don't have to move, right? So that's a challenge. And then there's a fraction of the community that can't, that might want to leave, but they can't. They don't have the fiscal means, they don't have the infrastructure means. And so the reality is when these, when these situations happen, um, not everybody can get out. We'll talk about, when we, when we get back to New Orleans, we'll talk about how that uh, occurred. But that's going on. Then you have the public safety people. Let get out, right? Come on, everybody, get out. I don't want you to die. I don't want you to get hurt. Get out. And then you have some people, who are you? I'm an American. You can't tell me what to do. And there's that. And so all these things get wrapped up, right? With all of these situations, Orville Dam, Hurricane Katrina, whatever, once we're into the disaster, the challenging time, we're kind of screwed, right? Whatever tools we have, by and large, those are the tools we have. That's not the time to invent a new approach, generally speaking, right? The, the command and control systems, the approach to understanding problems, all that stuff is, is what we started the disaster with. And um, the goal should be for us, our friends in New Orleans, Europe, Africa, Asia, wherever we're talking about, the idea should be to prepare ahead of time. Prepare ahead of time. And, this, and the, the stuff we talk about in this class, some of the stuff we'll see can be scary, right? It's like, oh my gosh, the folks are losing their houses or, or, or what's going on, right? But it's way better to deal with it now and try to set the, the ball in motion now rather than when we're, we're, we're in a giant line of cars like this and trying to figure that out, okay? Um, so... So this, I just illustrated this with our, with our most recent story, which is the, the problems with Oroville Dam. We, I could have done the exact same talk on wildfires in Southern California. Right? So uh, I remember after the 2007 fires in Malibu, we were out checking a site and I went in to, um, uh, I don't go to Starbucks, but for some reason we were going to Starbucks. Somebody I was with wanted to get a coffee or something. So we went in there and there were these um, uh, well-to-do folks that are standing in line and they were, and they're talking, it was a very long line, so they're talking, so I just wasn't trying to eavesdrop, but they, they were talking very loud. Uh, and so it was kind of obvious what they're talking about. And so essentially they were saying was, um, uh, oh, it's so tragic what, you know, oh my God, what are we gonna do? This is such a problem, ah, da, 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 da. 
and uh, it had been the anniversary of the, um, the uh, it was in August, so it was, it was in the, just after the anniversary of Hurricane Katrina, and there's still a lot of media attention, and so they started talking about Katrina, ah, oh, so sad, those folks, ah, so sad. But, you know, shouldn't have built their houses underwater. Shouldn't have, put, put, shouldn't have put, put their city in an area that was below sea level. So, you know, I'm really, I feel really bad for them, but, you know, shouldn't have done it. But, you know, we probably shouldn't rebuild. And then, because it was a long line, they talked about some other stuff. And then about five minutes later, they started talking about their houses. And it was obvious that one of their houses burned. Or, I, don't know, I don't know, completely down, or, but at least a lot of it burned. And so the, one of the ladies said to the other lady, so... You get insurance, got insurance money, great. So you're getting out? No way, we're rebuilding. The exact same thing, just a different setting, right? So our friends in Louisiana will, will love to point that out, right? They'll say, well, you guys got, you guys got hurricanes in Florida, and you guys got, got tornadoes in the Midwest, and you guys in California have drought, and this and that. And that's true, that's true. And so we should be careful of throwing stones, However, as we'll see, New Orleans is particularly, um, particularly vulnerable. So I think I might have told you guys last time that one of my friends from college said, we were always going to go road trip to, um, to New Orleans for um, Mardi Gras. Never did. But we're always going to go, always going to go. And then it was always, oh, shoot, it's this weekend because I don't plan very well. And so, oh, man, we, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we never go. My friend kept saying, you gotta go, you gotta go, you gotta go, and then he, then he moved back there and uh, said, you gotta come visit. I said, oh, I'll come visit. He said, no, you don't understand, you gotta come visit now. And I said, why? I said, because the next hurricane that hits this place, it's gone. It, the city won't recover. So this notion of recognizing our vulnerability, that's real, right? In the case of Oroville, a lot of people didn't recognize the vulnerability, but that doesn't mean it wasn't there. So, so let's, let's turn and start talking about what happened with Katrina. Oh, oh yeah, so one, one other thing I should say is the parallels, again, are just they're bizarre, they're amazing to me. FEMA, where's FEMA? Oh, here comes FEMA now, right? So they're coming on in, and to their credit, FEMA are starting to come in and start to do stuff. But uh, how do I say this? There's been no federal disaster declaration. Right? And maybe there shouldn't be, but it's surprisingly similar to what was going on in 2005, um, which at least at a gross level, I don't want to ascribe um, nefarious purposes to things, but the administration in power seemed to be a little bit out of touch with what the local folks experiencing the disaster needed. And that kind of seems to maybe be what's going on here. Um, we shall see. We shall see.